Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Haider Ayad Al Trisi. I will continue with the series of lecture in medicine uh, in the branch of uh, endocrinology, and here's the second lecture in the uh, about the subject of uh, diabetes mellitus. And in this lecture, uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the investigations in uh, diabetes mellitus and also talk about the complications of diabetes mellitus. And uh, starting with this slide showing the, the important and summary uh, of the important investigations that commonly used in the field of diabetes mellitus and these investigations used either in the diagnosis of disease or in the follow-up of the disease or also in detection of complications of diabetes mellitus. We have a urine exam and urine, urinary based investigations and also at the same time we have blood based investigations. Uh, urine glucose actually uh, is commonly used in, uh, in certain, uh, it's commonly used by patients actually. It's not recommended because the it's not don't it didn't give actual it doesn't give uh, the actual level of the plasma glucose and if it's sometimes we can see an uh, a positive blood glucose a positive urine glucose even in the presence of normal glucose in certain conditions and certain kind of disease like uh, renal tubular acidosis and for this reason it's not recommended the second urine exam is urine ketones and uh, later on I'm going to talk about it uh, in, uh, and show some details about the importance of urine ketones and the type of urine ketones, especially when I'm going to talk about uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Urine albumin is actually one of the most important urinary uh, based investigations in diabetes mellitus, whether type 1 or type 2 uh, diabetes. And uh, this is because it uh, gives us a clue and the diagnosis of uh, diabetes nephropathy at different stages. A blood glucose and uh, glycated hemoglobin A1C, they are, they, uh, both of them uh, give us the, the basis of the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus in either type 1 or type 2. And also they are important in following the patients to uh, assess the degree of control of those patients. What about the urine ketones? Actually, these uh, ketone bodies detected in urine and sometimes even can be measured in blood. But urine ketones uh, can be identified by the nitroprusside reactions, which uh, measures the acetoacetate and also acetone using either tablet or dipsticks. And dipsticks most commonly use way to detect urine ketones in uh, in our clinical practice. Uh, we have an other type of ketones, which is the, the beta hydroxybutyrate, and this ketone is very important, but cannot be detected by this urine dipsticks. Actually, ketone urea and uh, ketone bodies or ketones, uh, these develop as a result of the liver uh, production of these ketones from a free fatty acids from the gradations of the fats by a process of lipolysis, and. The presence of ketone in the urine indicate the absence or loss of the effective insulin function because insulin is uh, actually the most important and most powerful inhibitor of the ketogenesis. And so uh, it is important in the diagnosis of diabetes ketoacidosis. But also at the same time, ketone may be found in normal people who have been fasting or exercising strenuously for long periods and who have been vomiting repeatedly or have been eating especially a diet high in fat and low in carb. In these conditions, even physiological and not a disease conditions, there may be a mismatch between the glucose metabolism and the fat metabolism. So there will be more degradation of fat uh, that will compete and will prevent the degradation of the glucose so there will be production of ketone bodies and so for this reason actually ketone is therefore is not pathognomonic for diabetes as not also pathognomonic for uh, diabetes ketoacidosis the urine albumin can be uh, measured in two ways the standard dipstick testing 
The drawback and the negative point about the standard testing of the urine albumin, it will be positive only when the urine albumin concentration exceeds exceed 300 mg per liter. But it is important to detect even a, a lower level of this uh, albumin in the urine, which is called the microalbuminuria, because the diabetes related complication in the form of nephropathy can develop at a lower level of uh, albumin in the urine. The most important and most specific one is, is the specific albumin dipsticks or by quantitative by chemical laboratory measurements which can detect even a smaller amount of microalbuminuria that is uh, between 30 to 300 mg per liter and even lower level of microalbumin less than 30 and uh, so microalbuminuria or proteinuria in the absence of urinary tract infection is an important indicator of development of uh, diabetic nephropathy and this by itself actually results in increased risk for development of microvascular disease and also for the progression of diabetes nephropathy to end stage kidney disease. We have a, a long list of causes of albuminuria other than diabetes and these factors and these causes should be taken into consideration when are going to interpret a urine exam for, uh, for albuminuria because positive urine albumin can be seen also in the urinary tract infections, hematuria, and also at the time of menstruation in female, excessive and strenuous exercise, other glomerular disease like glomerular nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, other than diabetes, heart failure. In case of severe hypertension, we can see a detectable level of albumin urine. Your epithelial tumors actually in stone and fever, these conditions can result in a positive urine for albumin in the, even the absence of diabetes nephropathy. So sometimes we used to uh, do a general urine examination actually in order to exclude urinary tract infections before the interpretation of the urine dipstick or the quantitative assay for uh, microalbumin in the urine. Other investigations uh, in the blood glucose testing and actually the blood glucose can be measured by either uh, in form of serum gl blood glucose, uh, plasma glucose, capillary glucose or arterial glucose and also we have the whole blood glucose which is not commonly used. Uh, important to uh, know that uh, an 18 mg per deciliter of glucose is equivalent to 1 millimole in order to interpret the different uh, laboratory units uh, in order to uh, know the level of the blood glucose. For example, if we have a 6 or 5 or 10 actually, actually 10 millimole of blood glucose, this is equivalent to 180 milligram per deciliter of blood glucose. And this slide actually shows the differences between the uh, measurement of the blood glucose in different uh, uh, blood compartments actually. The capillary blood glucose or arterial blood glucose that uh, used to be measured by a glucometer. Actually, uh, this is higher than venous blood by 15%, especially a postprandial state, because they present the uh, blood glucose that is not uh, being used by these peripheral tissues. For this reason, we can see that uh, the glucometer can the glucometer blood glucose level usually higher than the venous blood. While also at the same time, whole blood concentration are lower than the plasma concentration by actually 15%. And it's because the blood cells contain relatively little glucose and the RPC will utilize the glucose by glycolysis. And so serum glucose is higher than the plasma glucose by 5% also due to shift in fluid from erythrocyte to plasma. But leaving the serum actually unseparated from the RBC more than one hour can cause the RBC in contact with serum will utilize the glucose. And so serum glucose values decrease rapidly in samples that have not been separated, uh, separate the cellular constituent of the blood. And so, in summary, the whole blood uh, it higher than the plasma blood glucose by 
and also the plasma glucose higher than serum by 5% but in general the most commonly blood glucose testing is the venous plasma values the most important or sometimes we use the serum blood glucose but most importantly and most accurate the venous plasma values are the most reliable uh, for diagnostic purposes what about the SMBG and with uh, an abbreviation of the soft monitoring of the blood glucose is used uh, uh, used to be checked using the glucometer and strip these should not be used for diagnosis of diabetes but it's main use for follow-up of patient in order to know the degree of control and to have special indications especially important for patient with type 1 diabetes and the, it is a result of the those patients being insulin treated in order to calibrate and to assist the requirement for insulin in those patients and regardless the type of diabetes or their type 1 after 2 the use of insulin especially in the multiple daily insulin injections those patients required serial blood glucose monitoring by glucometer pregnancy with diabetes also and patient with recurrent hypoglycemia in order to detect even a lower a relatively lower blood glucose to prevent the development of hypoglycemia and patient in the presence of major illnesses we, uh, those patients uh, they should check their blood glucose using the glucometer in order to detect uh, the variability of blood glucose whether hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia uh, in order to be treated accurately by adjustment of the treatments uh, especially for those patients with insulin therapy and those patients critically all in intensive care unit and patients with coronary care units especially in the presence and patient with acute coronary syndrome like myocardial infarction or uh, unstable angina. What about the glycated hemoglobin A1C? Actually, the hemoglobin A1C, what's called in also in Arabic, khudab dam atarakumi, this gives us an, uh, a clue about the glycemic control, the glycemic control in the preceding three months. And as it uh, said previously in the previous lecture, the from the diagnostic criteria for diabetes, uh, which is an HbA1c more than 6.5, this uh, why does it present the preceding three months? Because uh, uh, the HbA1c is related to the uh, lifespan of the RBCs with what 100, uh, 120, 120 days. So that's clue about the previous three months. But uh, these uh, glycated hemoglobin actually carry a lot of limitations and can be falsely uh, low and falsely high in certain conditions. And these factors should be taken into consideration when going to interpret the uh, level of HbA1c. And what are these limitations? The, actually, the glycated hemoglobin A1c can be falsely elevated. Uh, given, uh, given us a value that is higher than the real values or will be overestimated. In the presence of B12 deficiency, patient with a chronic renal failure, in the presence of hyperbilirubinemia, hemoglobin F, iron deficiency anemia, lead poisoning, alcoholism, high dose of aspirin. These, the presence of these factors in patients with type 2 diabetes and even sometimes in healthy patients can healthy person actually can result in a, a falsely elevated level of the glycated hemoglobin A1C. On the other hand, actually, the, the presence of uh, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, hemolytic anemia, chronic liver disease, conditions in which there is a reduction in the RBC lifespan like hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, also hemolytic anemia, Pregnancy as a result of dilution and increase of plasma volume, blood transfusions, B12 and iron therapy, phlebotomy and erythropoietin therapy. In these conditions, there will be the level of HbA1c actually will be falsely low and will underestimate the real level of the HbA1c. So, in, in presence of these conditions, uh, in the red line, in the red, uh, in the red side of this uh, slide. Uh, for example, if we have an HbA1c of, uh, of 10, for example, this uh, HbA1c of 10 may be as really it's uh, 9 or even below 9. While uh, on the green side, on the, on the green carton, the slide, 
if we have an HbA1c of 9, for example, the presence of these conditions uh, indicate that uh, this level of HbA1c of 9, maybe it's really 10 or even 11. Besides that, there's many other important factors. The presence of hemoglobinopathies, like the presence of uh, thalassemic rate, and the presence of sickle cell disease or sickle cell uh, trait, which is commonly seen in our uh, in our city here in Basra. This can result in great variability in the uh, HbA1c, and even sometimes the HbA1c cannot be correctly measured. In these patients, and we in those patients, we used to rely on serial blood glucose monitoring in order to assess the degree of control in those patients. Now I'm going to move to the next uh, sections of this uh, lecture. Talk about the complications of diabetes, whether type one or type two diabetes, and the actually the complication of diabetes can be divided into two types, the acute complications and also the chronic complications. The chronic complications can be divided into microvascular complications, which represent the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, like a uh, increased risk of cardiovascular disease because patient diabetes at high risk for development of cardiovascular disease in form of uh, myocardial infarction, uh, in form of acute coronary syndrome like instable angina peripheral vascular disease, uh, stroke, cerebral vascular accidents, and also other type of the chronic complications like microvascular complications like retinopathy, diabetes retinopathy, diabetes neuropathy with its different type, like uh, motor neuropathy, sensory neuropathy, and autonomic neuropathy. And also we have the uh, diabetes nephropathy and development of end stage kidney disease and the need of renal replacement therapy. Uh, and actually, the aim of the, uh, or the aim of a treatment of patients with diabetes mellitus, whether type 1 or type 2 diabetes, is really to prevent the development of these complications that can greatly uh, affect the patient's life span and result in increasing mortality and increasing morbidity of those patients. And uh, in the next lecture, not in this lecture, there'll be a more detailed, uh, details talk about these chronic complications, how to detect and how to assess and how to investigate for these complications and how to deal with them and how to treat them and how to prevent them in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Moving now to the acute complications of uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, we have uh, three important type of acute complications diabetic diabetic ketoacidosis and we have then ketotic hyperasmolar diabetic coma what's called the hyperasmolar state uh, the hyperglycemic hyperasmolar state with abbreviated hhs and also we have uh, importantly and most common acute complications which is the hypoglycemia this hypoglycemia actually the commonest acute complications which is which develop uh, as a side effect actually of the treatment of the disease with the use of uh, the hypoglycemic medications whether insulin or uh, non-insulin therapies and actually I'm going to uh, talk about both diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperasmolar state uh, together in order to see the differences between these two uh, important acute complications uh, and how to treat them and how to deal with them and how to differentiate between these complications and investigate them. Starting with the diabetic ketoacidosis, what, uh, why diabetic ketoacidosis happen? And uh, before going to talk about the pathophysiology and the uh, development of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, at this moment uh, it's important to uh, take into consideration that uh, diabetic ketoacidosis usually most commonly seen patients uh, and nearly uh, almost always taking uh, happen in patients with type 1 diabetes but uh, sometimes can be seen in patients with type 2 diabetes especially at the later stage of disease when they are uh, in patient insulin treated type 2 diabetes and sometimes in special uh, conditions what's called ketosis prone type 2 diabetes in those patients uh, develop diabetic ketosis at the onset of disease and later on will continue treatment with non-insulin based therapy, actually the oral therapy. 
Insulin deficiency is the most important and the hallmark and the most important factor for the development of diabetic ketoacidosis. And as a result of insulin deficiency, there will be hyperglycemia as a result of reduction in the utilization of the glucose. And this hyperglycemia will result in osmotic diuresis as a result of increased excretion of the glucose in urine. And this results in dehydration and also in electrolyte loss and electrolyte disturbance. And at the same time, in the absence of insulin and the presence of insulin deficiency, which is the most important inhibitor of lipolysis, and as a result of uh, uh, reduction in the availability of the glucose intracellularly, there will be stimulation of lipolysis to give us an alternative fuel of energy. And this lipolysis is in development of free fatty acids, and this free fatty acid will be taken by the liver, result in development of uh, ketosis and development of ketone bodies by liver. And also at the same time, as a result of uh, dehydration and reduction of blood pressure, as a result of the stress and the, the result of insulin deficiency, there will be elevation in the counter-regulatory hormone important in the catecholamine, epinephrine, and other stress hormone like the cortisol, the growth hormone. And these will stimulate more development of ketosis by stimulating more lipolysis and also will stimulate more development of hyperglycemia by inducing a glycogen lysis and a gluconeogenesis at level of liver. Ketosis by itself with its excretion uh, uh, in the urine result in more osmotic diuresis and dehydration. With the development of ketosis, when this uh, reached a level that cannot be uh, antagonized, result in a reduction in the pH of the blood and development of metabolic acidosis and the end with the hydrogen ion will be shifted into the cells and depletion with this replacing with the potassium and a cause electrolyte disturbance and this gives us actually the hallmark of diabetic ketoacidosis uh, which are the hyperglycemia ketosis and metabolic acidosis in order to have another look to the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis and at the same time to the hyperosmolar state. Uh, both of them actually represent one of the present an acute hyperglycemic complication, acute hyperglycemic crisis of diabetes mellitus. TKM was commonly taken and uh, hap uh, happened in type 1 diabetes and hyperosmolar state actually exclusively presents in patients with uh, type 2 diabetes, especially in elderly populations. And here we can see, importantly, we have three important factors, the uh, absolute, absolute insulin deficiency and in the, in the relative insulin deficiency in type 2 diabetes. Uh, in case of absolute insulin deficiency, there will be lipolysis because insulin actually are the most important and powerful inhibitor of lipolysis. And so uh, there will be increased lipolysis. And at the same time, lipolysis results in development of free fatty acid to be presented to the liver. And the liver actually will develop the keto, uh, result in, in development of ketone bodies by the process of ketogenesis. And these ketones with its acidity result in reduction of the alkali reserve and ketoacidosis and metabolic acidosis. The degradation of the uh, fats actually give uh, and supply the liver with the free fatty acids, which is actually a good fuel for the process of gluconeogenesis, which present as a gluconeogenesis a substrate. And so, as a result of both insulin deficiency and development of substrate for uh, gluconeogenesis, there will be increasing in the uh, gluconeogenesis at the level of liver. And, and so, by reduction of the glucose utilization, better by the peripheral tissues as a result of insulin deficiency and increasing gluconeogenesis, there will be hyperglycemia. And also at the same time, as a result of the dehydration, as a result of the stress of the diabetic ketoacidosis, there will be, uh, or the hyperosmolar uh, state also at the same time. The increase in the counter regulatory hormone also will stimulate the process also of the proteolysis and this will increase the gluconeogenic precursors of from degradation of the protein. So there will be more gluconeogenesis. And also the relative insulin deficiency and obsolete insulin deficiency, both of them, uh, with the release of the counter-regulator hormone, importantly, the glucagon actually, 
will stimulate the liver to degrade more glycogen at the level of the liver and the peripheral tissues, importantly at the level of the liver. So by glycogenolysis, increasing glycogenolysis and increasing gluconeogenesis and reduction of the peripheral glucose utilization, there will be hyperglycemia. And this hyperglycemia results in glycosuria with osmotic dialysis, uh, loss of fluid and electrolyte, and dehydration and impairment of renal functions. In patients with hyperosmolar state, they are all will taking here in the center, but there will be absent or minimal ketosis as a result of the presence of a small amount of the insulin circulating in the body. Actually, this small amount of insulin effectively can inhibit the process of lipolysis and the production of uh, uh, ketones bodies. So the important difference between the hyperosmolar state actually is the absence of metabolic acidosis and the absence of severe ketogenesis. And as a result of this, the pathophysiology for the development of the hyperosmolar state actually will uh, taking actually a weeks in patient critically ill uh, after uh, prolonged uh, dehydration, after prolonged diarrhea, they will be increasing the osmolarity. And this patient usually becomes severely ill and carry a high rate of mortality as a result actually present of many comorbidities. While di diabetic ketoacidosis will take days or weeks to develop, the process and the pathogenesis of decay actually more short relatively as compared to the hyperosmolar state. What is the ketone bodies? And the, actually, we have uh, three different types of uh, ketone bodies. They are water soluble compounds that are produced as a byproduct when fatty acids are broken down. Uh, for energy in the liver and the kidneys. We have the acetoacetate and 3-beta-hydroxybutyrate and the acetone. And this importantly, uh, important to present actually as a fuel of energy to the level of the liver, kidney, uh, and the brain. Uh, the acetoacetate and the acetone can be detected in the urine, while beta-hydroxybutyrate cannot be detected by the mistake in the urine, detected in the blood and can present a potent fuel of energy, especially in the uh, patient with enduring starvations, especially during pregnancy and the neonatal period. What are the causes of diabetic ketosis? As I said previously, the most important factor is the uh, absolute insulin deficiency. But sometimes also, even in the relative absolute insulin deficiency, in the release and increase in the counter-regulatory hormone, especially in the presence of stressful conditions, can result in the development of diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperglycemia. But the most important and the most common factor and cause for development of diabetic ketoacidosis is the omission or reduced daily insulin injections. And this followed by infections, pregnancy, hyperthyroidism, actually in state of hyperthyroidism, like in patients with Graves' disease and type 1 diabetes, the hypermetabolic state uh, that taking place as a result of the hyperthyroidism result in increasing the breakdown of the glycogen and hyperglycemia and can counteract the insulin action, result in recurrence uh, diabetic ketosis in those patients. Medications like steroid, thiazide, antipsychotics, these drugs uh, stimulate more hyperglycemia and can antagonize insulin. And sympathomimetics actually, uh, like, just like the counter-regulatory hormone, can stimulate the process of lipolysis. Uh, stressful conditions like myocardial infarction, cerebrovascular accident, GIT hemorrhage, embolism, pancreatitis, major trauma and surgery, all these conditions can precipitate the development of diabetic ketosis. What are the clinical features of diabetic ketosis? And uh, from the pathophysiology, the pathophysiology this can give us a clue about the symptoms. Uh, symptoms first related to hyperglycemia in form of increasing thirst, polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, and vomiting and abdominal pain as a result of severe hyperglycemia. And as a result of the increased polyuria and osmotic diuresis, there will be dehydrations. So there will be hypotension with weak thread peripheral pulsation and cold extremities, dehydration, dry skin, and increased capillary reflux time that can be elicited by clinical examination. The, later on, the acidosis. Acidosis clinically can be detected by a patient having a shallow, rapid breathing or hair hunger, which is called the cosmal or sighing breathing. 
This rapid shallow breathing represents uh, the compensatory mechanism of the body in order to deal with the metabolic acidosis by the increasing rebreathing in order to wash out the uh, CO in order to uh, and wash out the CO from the lung in order to reduce the blood in order to increase the blood pH. So in patient metabolic acidosis there will be what's called the compensatory uh, respiratory alkalosis. In patients with severe acidosis actually there will be even an abdominal pain uh, and also a disturbance in the conscious level. If left untreated at this stage, they will be uh, ill end with coma and even sometimes death. But fortunately, actually, nowadays the mortality of diabetic acidosis is extremely low. As a result, uh, the availability of uh, effective treatment for diabetic acidosis, which is the fluid and solid therapy. Uh, what are the biochemical criteria for uh, diabetic ketoacidosis? And this represents a triad of a uh, hyperglycemia exceeding 250 mg per deciliter. In the presence of acidosis as defined by, uh, by venous pH less than 7.3 and or bicarbonate less than 50 mm per liter, ketonemia or ketonuria. And also we have to take or think and uh, take into consideration there will be no severe uh, increase in the serum osmolarity as seen in patients with hyperosmolar state. And so the effect of serum osmolarity usually less than 320 milliosmol per kg. The investigation of diabetic acidosis, we have uh, venous blood and arterial blood gases and also urine analysis for ketones. Venous blood beside measurement of blood glucose uh, assessment of renal function by measurement of uh, urea and creatinine, uh, electrolyte and special important sodium and potassium because these two electrolytes are very important uh, in decision of treatment of patient with diabetic ketosis and selection of the type of the IV fluid and the initiation of potassium therapy in patient with diabetic ketosis uh, and hyperosmolar state. Bicarbonate actually from venous blood can assess the degree and severity of acidosis, patient diabetic ketosis, even uh, in the absence of the arterial blood gases, which uh, arterial blood gases actually can give us assess the severity of DKA, but uh, frequently unavailable at the time of the management of DKA, we can use uh, the venous bicarbonate to know the degree of acidosis and that uh, a bicarbonate level less than 12 mm per liter indicate the presence of severe acidosis. And of course also the urine analysis or blood analysis of ketone in order to detect the presence of ketones in order to differentiate whether a patient have hyperosmolar state or diabetic acidosis. ECG electrocardiography and infection screen and the, the Electrocardiography is important to exclude or to diagnose associated conditions of form of myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, and also importantly, can give us a clue about the potassium state in patients and electrolyte disturbance, especially for detection of a hypokalemia, uh, because uh, in patient hypokalemia have a specific or uh, have a certain ECG finding in the form of uh, tachycardia flattening or a T wave inv uh, inversion and uh, the finding of a U wave. And infection screen as a, in order to detect the cause or the associated condition that may be the stimulus for development of diabetic ketoacidosis or hypoosmolar state. This completed with a full blood count, uh, blood uh, on urine culture, selected protein, chest x-ray, but importantly these investigations should not delay the initiation of therapy uh, in those patients. Uh, it may be taking in the next or third day of the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. And also the inpatient with DKA usually we used to see a high rate or a high level of uh, leukocytosis that can even reach 15,000 or 20,000 white BC count and this uh, doesn't necessarily indicate presence of infections but just to present uh, uh, just like a, as a response in order, uh, the stressful condition of diabetic ketosis. What about the complication of diabetic ketosis and uh, fortunately actually these complications uh, can be prevented nearly in 100% of conditions by effective rapid and careful treatment of these uh, conditions. 
Cerebral edema, actually, this complication happened as a complication of our treatment of our mismanagement by rapid correction of the blood glucose or giving a, a, high, a large amount of hypotonic fluid at a use of uh, a bicarbonate level. I use uh, actually a bicarbonate therapy. Uh, wrong use of bicarbonate level, it can result in rebound uh, acidosis. And this bicarbonate level, also this bicarbonate infusion therapy, carry a complication of development of cerebral edema. This complication have a high rate of mortality, and uh, treatment of this condition will happen by mannitol and oxygen therapy and head elevations. Other complications also we have the acute respiratory distress syndrome, the thromboembolism actually most commonly seen in patients with hyperosmolar state, and for this reason, patients with hyperosmolar state usually the management coupled with administration of prophylactic anticoagulant therapy in order to prevent the thromboembolism, acute circulatory failure, and also renal failure as a result of the hypertension and circulatory collapse, and finally mortality rate, which is lower than. Uh, 1% in patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. For the hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, the criteria for diagnosis different from patient with diabetic, different from the criteria of diabetic ketoacidosis. This condition characterized by a severe hyperglycemia that can exceed 600 mg per deciliter. And so at the same time, uh, the presence of mild degree of acidosis uh, by a serum bicarbonate more than 50 millimole and arterial pH more than 7.3 and the either little or no ketonuria or ketonemia and also there will be a severe hyperosmolar state uh, defined by the effective serum osmolality that can exceed uh, 320 milliosmol per kg and also as a result of this severe hyperosmolality there may be uh, the patient may have uh, Become stupor, coma, as a result of severe dehydration and severe hyperosmolarity. And this final uh, condition, that the presence of stupor or coma, usually happen at uh, hyper uh, and serum osmolarity that can exceed 330 or 340 mL. And this slide, we can see the differences between the diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperosmolar state. Uh, different characteristics and different variables in the left. Uh, diabetic ketosis usually happen in younger age patients, especially in type 1 diabetes, as there's a type 1 diabetes, because they need an absolute insulin deficiency, while the hyperosmolar state usually in elderly patients with type 2 diabetes. The durations of the symptoms usually short hours to days, and while the hyperosmolar state took a longer time to develop, as a result, uh, for that can take days to weeks to happen. There will be a severe dehydration as a result on uh, severe dehydration in the hyperosmolar state as a result of severe hyperglycemia that it can exceed 600 mg per deciliter, while there will be mild to moderate dehydration in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, and this mild dehydration actually because the loss of fluid, half of this fluid will be lost from the intracellular phase, not of the extracellular phase. The, there will be an acidosis in patient with DKA with a pH less than 7.3, while the pH uh, equal or more than 7.3 in patient with the hyperosmolar state with a bicarb more than 15. There will be a more hyperosmolarity with an effective uh, serum osmolarity that exceed 320. Per kg. There will be an associated illnesses in the form of CVA, myocardial infarction, and many other illnesses, like sometimes in patients with acute gastroenteritis, there are illnesses. There will be a, a highly positive ketones bodies, or little or absence ketones. The mortality rate is the most important difference. Uh, DKA have a mortality rate that is lower than less than 1% while the mortality is 40% in even hyper and hyper osmolar state but, but fortunately this high rate of mortality associated with quite rare complications uh, quite rare complication rate of development of these complications in patients with type 2 diabetes this busy cartoon actually shows the the way the 
correct way of management of both uh, hyperosmolar state and diabetic ketoacidosis. Both of them represent actually a state of hyperglycemic crisis, whether type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So the line of the management for both these conditions actually the same with little differences. Both uh, these conditions need intravenous fluid and insulin therapy and potassium therapy plus minus bicarbonate therapy which is usually needed more in DKA in a state of very very severe acidosis and uh, very rarely this uh, bicarbonate infusion needed in the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. And uh, here in the starting with the IV fluid management which is most important whether a patient have hyperosmolar state or diabetic ketoacidosis. First of all, you need to assess and determine the hydration status of the patient because in the presence of severe hypovolemia, you have to administer IV fluid immediately in order to, uh, in order to supplement the patient with adequate amount of fluid to prevent circulatory failure and to prevent acute kidney injury. And so this uh, will be uh, done by administering a normal saline, which is 0.9%, uh, uh, normal saline, one liter, one hour. And this can be repeated according to the degree of hypovolemia. And in the presence of mild dehydrations, at this moment, you need to look for the serum sodium and to evaluate the serum sodium. And as a result of the presence of hyperglycemia in these conditions, the, uh, the level of serum sodium measured by the blood usually will be falsely low by these hyperglycemia. So we have to measure the corrected serum calcium by special formula. And here, if we have a higher, if we have a higher serum sodium, or serum sodium is normal, at this condition we have continued treatment of this patient using half saline, 0.45% normal saline, with a rate of fusion between. 250 to 500 ml per hour depending on the hydration status while if the serum sodium is low less than 135 and this condition you have to in this condition you have to continue uh, treatment with a normal saline 0.9 percent at a similar rate of fusion of 250 to 500 ml per hour depending on hydration status this rate of fusion will, will be continued with the follow-up of this patient and measurement of, uh, of a frequent measurement of the blood glucose of this patient. Uh, when the blood glucose reaches to 200 mg per deciliter in patient for DKA or 300 mg per deciliter in the hyperosmolar state, you will have to change the, the uh, fusion to a 5% dextrose with a half saline at uh, a rate of 150 to 50, uh, 250 ml per hour. So the rate of fusion and the amount of fluid will be halved and also the type of fluid that will be given also will be changed. Moving to the right side of this uh, management to the potassium which is very important we have to establish an adequate renal function. Never give potassium patient with oliguria because there will be a severe hyperkalemia and side effect of this potassium. And in the presence of oliguria or anuria, the kidney will reabsorb this sodium from the uh, kidney tubules, so there will be uh, a defense mechanism to prevent hyperkalemia. In order to prevent hypokalemia, actually, uh, if the urine output uh, equal to 50 mol per hour, at this moment, you can give patient potassium therapy additive to the intravenous fluid therapy and this uh, will depend on the starting potassium level if the patient already have potassium level less than 3.3 mL equivalent per liter because patient with diabetic ketosis already have potassium depletion even if the potassium level is normal at the start of the treatment at this moment the this potassium represents the extracellular potassium if it is less than 
don't give the patient insulin therapy because insulin therapy will exacerbate hypokalemia by shifting the glucose and potassium intracellularly so there will be more severe hypokalemia and this hypokalemia will carry a high rate of complication development of ventricular tachycardia and cardiac arrest so hold the insulin at this moment and give 20 to 30 milliequivalent per hour until potassium exceeds 3.3 milliequivalent per liter if the potassium at the start, if the patient at the start have potassium level more than 5.2 and at this moment don't give the insulin, just you have to check the serum potassium every 2 hours while in the condition with the serum potassium between 3.3 and 5.2 mq per liter at this time you can give two, uh, 20 to 30 mq potassium in each liter of IV fluid in order to keep the serum potassium between 4 to 5 and in order to avoid the development of hypokalemia as a complication of the uh, continuous inclusion of uh, insulin therapy in the hyperglycemic crisis whether a patient with hyperosmolar state or diabetic ketoacidosis uh, if you uh, uh, in the lack or frequent inavailability sometimes of the serum potassium in certain conditions we can rely on the electrocardiography as i said previously because this will give you an a clue about the uh, about the extracellular level of potassium because the presence of the ecg finding of uh, hypokalemia in form of uh, tachycardia a flattened t wave or even t wave inversion and the finding of U wave. Insulin therapy, the, uh, the best way to deliver insulin therapy uh, in these two conditions is by intravenous route and importantly in form of infusion therapy. You have to start patient by giving an abolus of uh, insulin from 0.1 unit per kg body weight given as IV bolus is followed by 0.1 units per kg per hour IV continuous infusion and sometimes you can start infusion especially in the condition when there is severe hyperglycemia uh, by 0.14 units per kg body weight per hour continuous infusion after one hour if the serum blood glucose doesn't fall by at least 10% from the starting uh, blood glucose and uh, for example if the starting blood glucose was uh, 400 if it is after one hour doesn't uh, reduce to less than uh, 360 you can give an, an, an other bolus of uh, insulin 0.14 unit per kg and that bolus then you have to continue the infusion the infusion rate will continue at the same rate whether in patient with hyperosmolar state or patient with diabetic ketoacidosis but when the, uh, the serum glucose reached to 200 mg per deciliter, you have to reduce the infusion rate to the half in 0.02 to 0.05 units per kg per hour, or shift the patient to rapid acting insulin 0.1 unit per kg subcut every two hour, and in order to keep the blood glucose between 150 to 200. While in patient with hyperosmolar state, the same thing you have to do, but uh, a target plus uh, serum blood glucose that can reach to, to 300 mg per deciliter at this moment you reduce the infusion rate to the half and in order to keep the serum glucose between 200 to 300 until the patient is mentally alert because the important thing here is not to treat and give an important and great effort to hyperglycemia itself the most important effort in order here to uh, treat the acidosis and dehydration and uh, frequent and regular measurement of the renal function and assessment of the urine output and the electrolyte every one to two hour and blood glucose every one hour and this actually will give us the will summarize the management of both diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperosmolar state as the two important complications of diabetic ketoacidosis I'm going to move here to the third acute complications, the hypoglycemia. And actually, hypoglycemia it is the most common acute complication of diabetes, whether type 1 or type 2. And it's defined by as reduced plasma glucose less than 70 mg per deciliter with symptoms and improvement of symptoms if the plasma glucose is increased. And this represents the definition of hypoglycemia. 
This table shows the counter regulatory hormone response to hypoglycemia in healthy person. And uh, the first response and the most important response of the body uh, to hypoglycemia starts when the glycemic threshold uh, reduced down to uh, below 80 mg per deciliter. And this first response represents reduction of the insulin or shut down the insulin release from the beta cells of the pancreas. But when the blood glucose is reduced below 70, there will be a second response, and a, probably this is the most powerful and most sponsor, important counter regulatory response in order to tackle hypoglycemia, which is the increased glucagon, because the increased glucagon will stimulate both uh, stimulate the glycogen and glyases and degradation of the glycogen stored in the liver, and will rapidly correct the hypoglycemia. And if the blood glucose persists below 70 and even below 65, there will be increase in the epinephrine, which will present a third response, and epinephrine. This will stimulate both glycogenolysis and glucogenesis, and this is an important response, actually, and will present the second response in condition when there is no glucagon release, especially in patients with type 1 diabetes. And also we have another uh, counter regulatory response which increases the uh, cortisone and growth hormone. This is actually not a so powerful response because the most important and uh, responses is the increasing glucagon and the epinephrine. At the level of glucose below 55 and even sometimes below 70, uh, there will be a behavioral changes in form of a uh, feeling of hunger and palpitations. And these uh, behavioral changes will stimulate the patient and give him the desire in order to take a food in order to uh, counteract hypoglycemia. But when the blood glucose and the glycemic threshold reduce below 50, which represent a severe hypoglycemia, there will be there will be reduction in the cognition level. And so there will be compromisation of the behavioral response. And this moment patient need the assistance of the third party in order to uh, reverse the hypo glycemia. What are the causes of hypoglycemia in patients with, uh, patient with type 2 diabetes? Actually, this is a long list of conditions, form of mist of if you're going to take insulin and delay intake of food, uh, unexpected unusual exercise, alcohol due to the alcohol is associated with poor oil intake and degradation of the glycogen store, and also prevent the gluconeogenesis at the level of liver, uh, inadequate dosing of oral anti-diabetic medication and insulin therapy, poorly designed insulin regimen, for example, taking insulin without taking food or taking insulin at night with a small meal, lipohypertrophy at injection site, for example, this result in the variability of the insulin absorption. Renal failure is very important and a common scenario in patients with uh, a good control of glucose later on will develop a frequent attack of uh, a frequent and recurrent attack of hypoglycemia a similar regimen of a treatment of anti-diabetic medications and in this condition we have to suspect the presence of renal failure because the, the half-life of insulin will be longed and will be lengthened in the presence of renal failure and also there will be loss of the gluconeogenesis uh, as a counter-regulatory mechanism uh, at the level of the kidneys gastroparesis uh, or delay gastric emptying as a complication of autonomic neuropathy will result in mismatch between the insulin absorption uh, and also and the, the and the glucose absorption after oral intake, malabsorption and certain conditions like certain endocrine disorders like Edison disease and sometimes importantly factitious deliberately induced by using an uh, uh, deliberately higher doses of anti-diabetic medications or insulin therapy in order to uh, cause the hypoglycemia for self-harm in certain patients. Types of hypoglycemia actually have different types. Hypoglycemia can be classified as nocturnal hypoglycemia and daytime hypoglycemia. And also we have a mild to moderate hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia. Severe hypoglycemia usually defined as by blood glucose less than 53 mg per deciliter or hypoglycemia that need the assistance from the other or third parties in order to counteract hypoglycemia. And confirmed hypoglycemia and confirmed the unconfirmed usually a patient have symptoms of hypoglycemia without measurement of blood glucose while confirmed 
finding of symptom of hypoglycemia together with confirmed measurement of blood glucose by uh, blood glucose or by glucometer. There is actually a, a long list of symptoms of hypoglycemia. Uh, you can read it here from this slide. The, it can be classified into adrenoglycopenic uh, symptoms and neuroglycopenic symptoms. They are also non specific symptoms. The importantly, and adrenal glycopenic symptoms of form of shakiness, anxiety, nervousness, palpitation, tachycardia, sweating, uh, as a result of exaggerated sympathomimetic response, uh, a response to hypoglycemia. And this moment, patient will feel the hypoglycemia, and they have the desire in order to take glucose in order to reverse hypoglycemia. Patient with a frequent attack of hypoglycemia, there will be weaning and exhaustion of this adrenoglycopenic response, and so the patient may not develop these symptoms at this moment and will pass uh, pass uh, directly into the neuroglycopenic symptoms, and this is actually harmful and can result in reversible brain damage. And these symptoms include uh, abnormal mentation, and specific dysphoria, depression, crying, focal neurological deficit, and even abnormal behavior, and, and even uh, sometimes the patient may be mistaken as a drunkenness, uh, stroke-like manifestation, hemiplegia, many, many, and even convulsions. Uh, and this condition presents a severe hypoglycemia and need to be rapidly managed and correctly managed by intravenous glucose, then specific in form of hunger, barbarygmia, nausea, vomiting, and this represent uh, actually parasympathetic response of hypoglycemia, especially important the feeling of hunger. The diagnosis of hypoglycemia defined by the presence of pupil triad, uh, which are the presence of symptoms and signs of hypoglycemia, and the glucose less than 70 mg per deciliter, and together with improvement of these symptoms after intake of glucose, and this actually represents triad of hypoglycemia. If the hypoglycemia left untreated, there will be a long list of complications of form of brain complication, heart and eye complications. And these brain complications can be sometimes irreversible, like the focal neurological deficit or stroke or transit ischemic attack as a result of uh, dysfunction of the brain cells as a result of hypoglycemia, cardiac arrhythmia as a result of prolonged QT interval and sometimes even myocardial ischemia, eye complications in form of vitreous hemorrhage or worsening retinopathy, and this also can happen even with rapid correction or rapid normalization of blood glucose, and sometimes patient liable for development of road traffic accidents or self-injury, as a result of passing out, as a result of hypoglycemia and hypothermia. And how to treat, and the treatment of hypoglycemia actually depends on the degree and severity of this hypoglycemia. In the, if the hypoglycemia is mild, can be treated subtly with oral fast acting carb, 10 to 15 gram taking as a glucose drink or tablet. And this should be followed by a snack containing complex carbohydrate in order to prevent rebound hypoglycemia because this uh, oral fast acting carb will be rapidly absorbed and rapidly degraded. While in case of severe hypoglycemia, this need to help uh, and need the external help of by third parties. If the patient is semi-conscious or unconscious, this uh, should be treated with parenteral treatment uh, by intravenous administration of 20% dextrose. And if it is available at the same time, we can give uh, an IM a glucagon 1 milligram or 0.5 milligram in children. And this uh, IM glucagon, importantly, especially in patients with type 1 diabetes, is due to inadequate or weaning a glucagon response to hypoglycemia in patients with type 1 diabetes as compared to patients with type 2 diabetes. While if the patient is actually conscious and able to swallow, in case of uh, severe hypoglycemia, you can give an oral refined glucose as drink or sweets or uh, you can apply glucose gel or jam or, or honey uh, to the buccal mucosa. This uh, glucose gel or jam can be rapidly absorbed from the uh, buccal mucosa even after, uh, even before reaching to the GIT tract to be absorbed. Important thing also we need to consider in the treatment of hypoglycemia. The correction of hypoglycemia is not the end, especially if the hypoglycemia results from complications 
uh, of uh, anti-diabetic medications, especially the secretagog, the old generation, uh, sulfonylureas like lipoclamide or long-acting insulin therapy, especially in patients with renal failure also. Those patients need to be uh, kept in the hospital for a few days in order to be sure there will be no rebound and no repeated attack or recurrent attack of hypoglycemia. Because in patient with renal failure, the, there will be accumulation of these medication in the body, make the patient liable for development of recurrent attack of hypoglycemia. And because this also glipinclamide actually have a longer half-life that can reach even one week and even higher, especially in the presence of renal failure. And also at the same time, in order to titrate and readjust and uh, administer another type of medications that associate with lower risk of hypoglycemia. And uh, actually, this is the end. Uh, this presents the uh, end of this lecture. And uh, I hope uh, it was uh, fruitful and uh, present with important information and you have uh, understand it well. If you have any question, you can lift it uh, here. And uh, the next uh, lecture, actually the next week, will, uh, there will be a talk first about the chronic complications of diabetes mellitus type 1 or type 2, uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes mellitus. And this is the end, and thank you, and uh,